Joe Hernandez is an accomplished entrepreneur. As chairman and founder of Blue Water Vaccines and Blue Water Acquisition Corporation, he's leading the way toward a universal flu vaccine and joining the SPAC brigade. But why did he work for the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs? And why did he let his young son make him go back to graduate school for a Master of Science degree 20 years after he thought he was finished with his education? In this episode of the Health Biz Podcast, Joe shares his life story from the immigrant son of political prisoner to Merck, Athymetrics, and a variety of biotech roles. Joe has about done it all. He's not through yet though. He's launching a Hemingway themed restaurant in Palm Beach and he's getting ready to treat Alzheimer's disease. These are still works in progress. I'm your host, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. We help fast moving companies like Joe's navigate blue waters, orange waters, and white waters too. If your healthcare or life sciences company needs strategy consulting support, please contact me. Joe Hernandez, Chairman of Blue Water Acquisition Corp and Blue Water Vaccines. Welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me this morning. Absolutely. Well, we're going to talk about today and about tomorrow, but I got to wind the clock back first and ask you about your, your childhood. What was your childhood like? Who were your early influences? <laughs> well, actually, I'm a, I'm, I'm a son of I'm an immigrant. I'm actually, I was born in Cuba, believe it or not. And um, my father was a a political prisoner in Cuba. So I had a, a lot of uh, very unique experiences compared to the average American childhood. So, uh, but a wonderful, yeah. wonderful childhood, of course. Wonderful. You yeah, certainly, when you, you know, when you have a background like that, usually you know, grow up with some, some strong opinions and impressions around the, the house. So I'm guessing you're, you know, for influences, you didn't have to go any further than uh, the next room. <laughs> That's true. Very, very true. And then what, uh, how did you think about what you wanted to study in, uh, in school? Well, I come from a, a long line of scientists and physicians. Um, actually, all my cousins are physicians. I'm the, the only one that went the scientific route um, slash business route. Uh, so it was expected in our family that, you know, you had, you had three choices. You could either be a doctor, a doctor, or a doctor. And, and uh, I chose the fourth choice, which is to be a scientist. Uh, so it was it was kind of a family affair. Yeah. No, fair enough. You know, I actually interviewed somebody on the podcast whose name was doctor. And I said, how did you decide you want to be a doctor? And he says, well, his parents were all in the medical profession. And he, you know, used to take his his uh, his sister to her gastroenterology appointments. And his name was doctor. So, you know, gastroenterologist was pretty <laughs> he, obvious. But He got the title but, before the title was given. <laughs> exactly. That the thing is, you know, I, I know it sounds pretty straightforward, but I also noticed you just like, it's like you just graduated this year from school. What's the story with that? Oh me, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so I see. To, um, I see. It's like you, you know, you you were a sci scientist, but then you sort of wrapped it up, you know, twenty twenty five years ago, and then all of a sudden I see Master of Science twenty twenty one. Yeah, well, you know, it's like a pandemic thing. <laughs> it's one way to stay young, you know, go back to school a lot. Now, I uh, actually, it's kind of funny. The, the story originates from a kind of a, a little um, challenge I had from with uh, with my. Uh, 14 year old boy who was not 14 at the time, he was about, I guess, 11 or 12, where, you know, he came up to me one day and we're talking about science and we're telling him about all the, you know, stuff we're doing scientifically that's pretty cool. And he's like, oh, dad, it's so amazing. Uh, but dad, I have one question for you. If you were so smart, why didn't you go to Harvard or Yale? I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because apparently that's the metric of being smart. So I said, you know, you know, if you really wanted to in life, you could really do it. You just have to devote yourself and commit yourself and work hard and you can get in there. And he looks at me with the corner of his eye, he goes, daddy, I don't think you could have done it. And I said, oh, okay. So that evening I get into the computer and I'm like, you know, I'm going to prove a point to this kid. And yeah. uh, I had missed a Harvard deadline. That's the reason why I didn't apply. But so I had like a couple of days to apply to the Yale um, graduate school program. And I applied and uh, kind of forgot about it. Luckily they used my scores for back in the, uh, Back in the yeah. early days, I was able. I didn't have to take the the GREs or anything. That's good. Crazy again, thank God. And uh, lo and behold, like a month later, I get this letter from Yale, you know, and I've forgotten about the whole, you know, ego exercise that I had done. And um, sure enough, I get in. So I show the letter to my son. I'm so proud. I'm like, look, it's amazing. You can work. You know, if you work hard, you can get anywhere you want. He's like, oh, that's wonderful, Dad. But are you going? And I'm like, what? Yeah. That wasn't the challenge. <laughs> so anyway, here I was, a couple of years later, uh, matriculated and graduate school at Yale, I was, you know, holding two full-time jobs. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I really enjoyed 
um, that kind of experience. It was really wonderful. And I proved a point. You can do anything in this amazing country. <laughs> yeah. No, it sounds good. Well, it's not too late for Harvard, but uh, yeah, well, we'll have to yeah. see. I'll take it you a be little careful what you, you can be <laughs> careful what you say. Anyway, so you know, I actually look at people's uh, you know resumes, LinkedIn profile, and all that, and 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 usually by you know someone with your level of accomplishment, number of years of experience, usually it's like an honorary degree, not like when you actually have to work for and pay for tuition. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that's did, that's impressive. I take exams and go to class and you know all, all the good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Now I also noticed you know you started work at uh, Big Pharma and then you went to some you know sort of smaller biotechs and things along the way. And I want to ask yeah. you about that, but I also noticed. I got to ask you about one other thing, because you told me, you know, given your Cuban background, I guess it's not surprising that you would become a senior advisor for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark. But you're still going to have to explain that one a little bit to me. Yeah. That's not totally evident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, they always say, you know, as Yogi Berra says, when it was a fork comes in the road, you take it. So, yeah. you, you know, it was a, it was a um, kind of a, a funny situation. So I had I had um, I'd sold one of my companies and I had. But basically a non-compete, I couldn't really do anything. And I was like, you know what, I'm bored, I'm in Manhattan. And I had um, put out a press release that, you know, I had sort of stepped down from my role. And lo and behold, I get a, I get a phone call from somebody who's working at the um, the Danish ambassador's office. And I'm like, I don't know any Danes, and why are they calling me? Anyway, yeah. to make a long story short, the, the, um, the ambassador of uh, Denmark to New York, um, was looking for a, a, a biotech person that had a lot of experience in financing and whatever not to try to help kind of biotech companies in Denmark, who, who are many amazing companies, by the way, which are many amazing companies, um, to come and seek financing and partnerships in the U.S. And he thought, you know, this guy's bored and he can't do anything, so why not? So anyway, so I spent a, a year tour with uh, the Danes, who are amazing people, an amazing country. Uh, with amazing companies and uh, really expanded my global um, Rolodex, if you would, but really met some great people along the way. That sounds good. I'm, I've actually never been to Denmark, but I'm, I am uh, scheduled to go there in August. I'm going to uh, to Copenhagen as actually oh, mostly going to spend it. my time in Sweden. But it sounds uh, it sounds it. very good. And at one time, somebody who showed that they have maybe a lack of understanding of like population sizes in the world. I was in Hong Kong, and uh, she, this person guessed that I was from Denmark. And it's like, you know, considering the population there versus the U.S., if, if you see somebody and you think they look like they're from Denmark, you should still probably guess they're from the United States. Yes. But, uh... <laughs> Very true. So, you know, Merck was a, was a starting point into the, into the biotech world. What was, what was the, sort of the career journey like there? Well, I got to tell you, I, I, my experience at Merck was amazing. I, I still view Merck as one of, the, one of the best American companies uh, out there. I mean, it was really... An amazingly, amazingly well-oiled machine, from a marketing perspective, um, highly ethical. You know, for a company that big, to kind of instill a culture of ethics and giving back. I mean, their culture is about you know do what's right for the patient, and everything always works out. And I got to tell you, um, I think it set the basis for um, how I viewed the world, and, and I'm so appreciative of that experience. Just an amazing culture. I could, I could only, only have the highest. Um, uh, regards for that company. I mean, it's uh, it was an unbelievable company. It still is an unbelievable company. So it's really quite a, you know an impressive place, and I, I know what you're saying. They were very proud of you know what they did for like the um, I think a river yeah. disease uh, yeah, in Africa. You know, they had like a big yeah big emphasis on that. Do the right thing, and that you know the profits will follow. So yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, no, I, that's I love they... the culture. The people that I, I met there, you know, are still friends. Uh, I've been lucky. I mean, I've been lucky to have that be the foundation for my for my corporate career. So then, you know, on to some biotechs and maybe you can hit the highlights. I just picked out the Denmark part and not necessarily for the yeah. biotech part of it, but any, any interesting things kind of along the way before, uh, well, you know, your current roles? Yeah, I mean, I, so one of the, you know, it's a great company, of course, Mark is a great company, but if you're, you know, if you're utterly ambitious and impatient, which I'm both, unfortunately, you know, big corporate America is a good place to learn and then you do your own thing, right? So. I guess about two or three years into um, working at Merck, um, I interacted with my um, with my mentor and and my my boss, who was really my mentor. And um, you know, he uh, it was it was an employee review, and of course, I was doing well, so it was wonderful. But he brings out this uh, this algorithm, and he says, "Well, what career path do you want?" I said, "Well, 
He goes, what do you really want to do? I said, well, I would really love to run the company. And he looks at me and he yeah. smiles and he goes, what, what? <laughs> and he showed me this algorithm where I could be a director or, or, a, or a senior manager in 10, 12 years. And I was like, that's too long for me, you know? So of course that day, that night I pondered, I said, this is an amazing place, but I really need to be in a more entrepreneurial place. And of course, at that time, uh, and even to, the, to some extent today, the most entrepreneurial place on the planet was Silicon Valley. So I started looking at a company in Silicon Valley, found this role um, in a company called Affymetrics that was doing some really amazing genomics works, a company I had already known about, and um, applied. And sure enough, like two days later, they flew me out and I was hired on the spot and, uh, you know, gave my notice to Merck and then drove all the way across the country to Silicon Valley and, and really joined a company that really altered the genomics revolution. Another amazing company, you know, in a very different way, but um, was really honored to be leading a marketing effort for, in my 20s, for a company that really revolutionized the world. So I was very honored. Uh, I got the startup bug. That was the place where I, you know, I, I got inspired to do a lot of spin outs and whatever not, and where I met some amazing people that I'm also still very close with. Uh, a lot of the people that I work with are running their own companies. And, you know, just it's a, it was a basket of, uh, of entrepreneurship, which I loved and changed my life. Yeah, that sounds like you were there at a great time yeah. uh, as well. Yeah. So no, nicely, nicely done. So, you know, vaccine development um, and, and blue water vaccines, you know, we, we talk about like, you know, the blue ocean or whatever, that's like a very expansive opportunity. Yeah. Is, that, is that the thinking behind blue water vaccine or are they actually made from blue water? No, no, it's a, it, you, you were on the right track initially. Now, I'm a, okay. I'm, a, I'm a person who loves the sea and loves the ocean and loves everything about the ocean. So, you know, when we started um, thinking about the concept of universal uh, flu, you know, I thought it was such a such a challenge, such an amazing um, um, unknown. And what is what is greater than the unknown than, you know, the, the, the deep blue water. So. That's kind of the genesis of the of the name, and and I've sort of kept it for a number of other entities, but blue water is kind of I think a, um, a theme that resonates with me both spiritually and and uh, from a branding perspective, I guess. You know, so when you talk about you know a vaccine for all influenza strains, I mean, what does that mean? What's the need for that? And you know, is that actually a practical thing or is it sort of like a pipe dream? Well, we thought it was a pipe dream. You know, we we've always um, assume that, you know, we can't really conquer the evolutionary path of influenza and of any virus for that matter. And to some extent that's correct. Although influenza um, is really not as diverse as we think. Uh, and really the, 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 the seeding um, scientific dot that was put forth back in 2007 came from um, a statistician, a, a really a mathematician based out of Oxford University who wrote this paper about the fact that, you know, influenza is really not that diverse. If you look at it uh, and you compare it to really diverse viruses, influenza is really uh, mediocre uh, at best. And and so she proved that mathematically. Um, and, you know, the, the, the logic was almost there, but we never really saw it. You know, and, and the question is, look, if, if influenza is so, so diverse, why don't we have a thousand copies or, or 10,000 copies? Uh, or even a couple of hundred copies per year. We don't. We only have one predominant virus a year. And I think if you start thinking about that and you go back to the epidemics uh, that have happened through really through human history, there have only been one primary virus that causes these massive uh, diseases. And um, the, the repertoire of the genome of the virus is such that they have to recycle a lot of their tools. So under that notion, we sort of... Uh, um, came up with uh, scientifically a, a virus a vaccine that we think will cover all the, the strains of influenza we'll see in our lifetime. You know, of course, uh, in this past year and a half or so, there's only one thing people can can talk about, which is that other virus. Yeah. And you hear about, um, you know, you've got a vaccine, various vaccines actually, and then you hear about these, you know, variants, I'll call them strains. Um, yeah. and I heard the term scariant the other day. Yeah. So if you think about, you know, influenza versus uh, the uh, this novel coronavirus, we make the same kind of assertion about that. I don't know if that's your your area or not, but, you know, you mentioned influenza is only sort of average in terms of its uh, its diversity. What, what about, what, where does the coronavirus fall? 
Well, the coronavirus also falls, in my opinion, in the, in the mediocre category. Um, mediocre for different reasons. First of all, it's not really, when they talk about these variants, they're not truly variants. They're, they're sort of genetic uh, blips that don't really have a, a change on function. It's not like HIV. When HIV changes, you leave the room, there's something else in the room, right? Yeah. Um, you know, coronavirus is by extension um, or by definition is really a very um, limited genomic virus. I mean, we, we've known about things like uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and we should, certainly have known about SARS, which are very similar viruses in nature, but they're, you know, they're, they're, um, they're really different viruses from a, from a phylogenetic perspective. Um, the thing about coronaviruses compared to flu is it's really, coronavirus is not a really good killer. It, it doesn't, it, you know, it, it doesn't win the killing award, unfortunately, or fortunately for us, I should say. You know, it, it has a very low mortality rate, uh, which is the reason we've had a lot of infections, but not a lot of deaths, unless you're over 65 and have complications. The data has said that from the very beginning of coronavirus. Um, so, you know, maybe we overreacted, maybe we didn't. I, it, it's hard to say, you know, what the outcome would have been otherwise, but it's not a good killer. It just isn't. Uh, by contrast, influenza is a good killer. Influenza will kill you. Uh, it has a very good likelihood of killing you, irrespective of your age. And the younger you are and the older you are, it's even better at killing you. I, ironically, Corona can't, it was not really a good killer of, of young people. It, you look at the death rate profiles. If you're young and you got coronavirus, it was a bad night, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's not a really good killer compared to, you know, compared to, you know, a virus like influenza. And it's certainly not a good killer like Ebola. Ebola, if you get Ebola, you you flip a coin, you, you're alive or dead. Yeah. So there's a spectrum of mortality, efficiency, and Corona is just not the best at that. And, uh, you know, influenza is a pretty good killer. So if you think about vaccine development, which obviously you think about uh, having run a comp running a company that, that does that, you know, everyone's thinking about vaccine development these days. And I think even those that knew a lot about it were a little bit surprised at how fast you know, the vaccine development could occur, how, you know, how quickly you got a bunch of vaccines uh, on the market. I don't know, maybe you'll tell me that's not, not surprising. But what have we, you know, what's different if you look where we are sitting now in, in the middle of 2021 as you look at vaccine development for your own company or just more broadly compared with, let's say, two years ago, uh, you know, before this latest uh, latest frenzy? Well, I think I think two things have happened, which is wonderful. And again, you got to look at the silver lining of this of the situation with COVID. W one is, you know, when I um, set out to start a vaccine company, I would go and call my venture capital friends and I'd be like, hey, you know, let's have a drink. I'm starting a company. It's a vaccine. And they're like, Joe, great. We'll have a drink with you. We'll probably let you buy it. But we're not going to invest in vaccines. Vaccine companies yeah. are just not something we invest in. It's, it's, a, it's a loser. They'll say, they'll say like, yeah, if, you want a chair, if you want a charitable yeah. contribution, maybe I'll, uh, I'll throw a hundred bucks your way. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 uh, it's not an investable thesis because com pharmaceutical companies don't like to invest in them. There's too much exposure. The development time cycle is super long, yada, yada, yada. You know, it's not the place you would invest. So, you know, I had a, a semi-difficult time raising capital, although ultimately we, we were able to find some partners that understood the value of a universal flu vaccine and, and other programs that we've since uh, acquired. Um, but it was a challenge. So that's one. The other thing is the regulatory path is a monster. It's, you know, it's a long, arduous regulatory path for vaccine development because, you know, it's something that has such broad deployment that the, the regulators want to make sure this thing is really safe. Um, and rightfully so. I mean, I don't... I don't um, I don't think that's a humongous burden because it is, it, these, these are long-term, you know, they're, they're applied for 20, 30 years, generational uh, medicines that are applied. Uh, um, so we have to know exactly how they work and how they affect people. Um, and then the last part is, you know, we've been using technology that's been around since the very beginning, you know, for influenza, for example, we manufacture influenza and chicken eggs, you know, that's a technology that's probably as archaic as pipetting with your yeah. mouth, you know, that kind of stuff. So, this allowed for new technologies to be developed. And, and one of the things about the COVID vaccines that was really fascinating was that they both use mRNA technology, a technology that people said would never really see the light of day because it was so futuristic. And here it was, and, you know, we're, we're all now, you know, we all have vaccines to mRNA based uh, uh, antigens, which is amazing. It's amazing. So, so it's been, it's been good for the, for the field. Again, if you can find a silver light, a silver lining for COVID. Um, I think COVID has been good in terms of pushing technologies that would probably have taken another 
10, 15 years to get out there. So, you know, you mentioned you like blue water and, and so you've got not only the uh, blue water vaccines, but also blue water acquisition corp, which is a SPAC. So it's like, do you call yeah. it BWAC or is it, uh, you just call it <laughs> we do call it BWAC water. actually. That's our, that's our kind of our, um, our internal, um, uh, name for the, for the company's BWAC. Yeah. Sounds good. So, so SPAC's obviously a big, uh, exciting area. You see it a lot in biotech and, and pharma. You know, what's your perspective on on SPACs? Did you did you go in? Did you get the idea to, you know, to start up a SPAC, or did you sort of happen into that as a you know as a good vehicle for the moment? No, actually, SPACs have been on my on my radar for probably almost ten years. You know, we, <clears throat> um, I have a a good friend who's my a banker neighbor in Greenwich, Connecticut, and you know, we'd go out on the boat and he's like, Joe, you really, you really should consider a SPAC. And I was like, what is that? So, you know, when we were, you know, during our fishing and, and our Bud Light sessions, we, you know, we talk about SPACs and, you know, after doing a couple of uh, readings into the, the vehicle, I thought, you know what, this would be a great vehicle to bring a company public. That's a biotech that has a good theme, but, you know, needs to get public quickly. Um, you know, and, and you can, you can, you can, you can bring in, input or value into these companies by either board members or experiences and whatever now, which, you know, we, we had at that time, I had had a lot of exposure to different companies and financings. Um, so lo and behold, you know, the, the, as the uh, epidemic was closing in, you know, we were, I was kind of, my, you know, my efforts with the vaccine programs were really for the most part shut down because Oxford, which is where we do most of our research, yeah, um, was pretty much shut down. I mean, they, they literally closed the university. It's unheard of. It it hasn't happened since I, I think the last time it happened was like the Spanish flu. It, it, it didn't right. even close it during the war. It was unbelievable. But um, anyway, so so uh, they were shut down. I was like, well, you know, I'm kind of bored, and um, so we we launched. Um, I actually launched a COVID nineteen vaccine company during the the pandemic, which. I had for six months and sold. So um, so here it was, the project I thought was going to be keep me busy during the pandemic. I ended up selling. So here I had money and I was bored. So I was like, okay, let's do a SPAC. So uh, so we we did a SPAC. Uh, I primarily, I am the sponsor of the SPAC. So we put in, I put in about $4 million of capital uh, and funded this company. We, we brought it public. Uh, we brought some of the, the best board members we could find around, some really, really seasoned people. And we started looking and we looked at a great number of deals, over a hundred deals, and settled down on a handful of deals. And you know, within a couple of months, we had a we had a, you know a merger agreement with a company that I just love, love the management team, and love the company, and and we're excited about finalizing that deal and getting a company public via SPAC. You know, you could say in some ways that a SPAC is like a mRNA, something that's actually been around for a while and sort of had this, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but, you know, people had done SPACs in the past, the sort of the thing existed, there was a logic to it, but it hadn't really been taken to any great uh, extent. You know, what accounts for why they become popular really over the last couple of years? You know, it's a great question. Um it's it, it's it's a vehicle that w w has been known. I mean, there there's SPAC specific investors in the space, so it's not like there's not investors that understand the space. It's you know, if you're an investor, it's one of the best places to get returned in the public markets if you know how to do it right. Um, so it had all the right elements of um, of a of a good sort of investment vehicle. Um, I think it started really becoming popular when the big banks were doing the deals. You know, when you saw J.P. Morgan and you know, city and all these big banks doing doing SPACs. I think it created a validating um, thing, and I think it sort of took off. I think it, it got a little bit heated um, when you you know when you had a Rod doing SPACs when the guy didn't know what public markets are. I yeah. Mean, I mean, insult him, but you know when you were using names to brand SPACs, that you know you know that that that's when a market kind of gets a little bit sideways. And I think um, I think it slowed down to a point where. It, I think it's realistic and manageable, but I don't think they're going to go away. I mean, I think our SPACs are, yeah. are here to stay and they're a good vehicle to get companies public and they're efficient. They're uh, investor friendly. There's a lot of really good values as to a lot of really good reasons why as, as to why a SPAC is an important investment vehicle. And are they, are they good for biotech and pharma in, in particular, or we just happen to see a lot that are, you know, going uh, the SPAC um, in that space? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, and I haven't really looked at the breakdown of, of SPACs, but I think a great deal of them are um, more high risk entities like, you know, the, the electric car 
storage and you know a number of very novel sort of technologies technologies and biotech um i think it's just an alternative vehicle i mean i think you know biotech companies go public without revenues it's just you know we usually don't have revenues when we go public so for us i think the risk profile is no different i think it's just an alternative vehicle that allows company to get there a little bit faster um and it, it's companies that have either are lining up to go public already uh, have that vision in mind to go public or um have tried to go public or or their assets that really belong in a public company like spin outs from pharma or whatever not so it's it's a very um niche sort of area in terms of um getting the companies public they still have to be public ready i mean you can't you can't bring a startup public without it having the, the correct infrastructure and management team and audits and whatever not so it's just an alternative vehicle to get public yeah not interesting well changing the subject here to something that i ask all the, all the guests which is if you've had any time or inclination for reading uh lately and if so if there's any books that you you recommend or, or in fact that you recommend people not waste their time with oh my gosh so um i'm a i'm a a lover of hemingway i, I love he- ernest hemingway He's, he was a um, you know, he was a flawed human, like we all are, but really an amazing human in his own in his own right. So I, uh, I'm actually um, when I came to Australia, I <clears> had <throat> family here, so I came to visit. I had two weeks of quarantine in a hotel, which allows you to do a lot of a lot of nothing for two weeks. And one of those things, I was like, you know what? When I read my first Hemingway book and I fell in love with him as an author, um, I wanted to know what that feeling was like because I remember falling in love with. A writer, which is weird, but you don't remember why. So I, I picked up the book that I read, which is The Old Man and the Sea, and I read it again recently. And I got to tell you, um, it was like a it was like a, a rekindling of love with with a, with a with a with an author, and I, I understood why. And so that was the last book I read, which was you know again like two weeks ago. <laughs> nice. Yeah. No, that's very good. So has your has your son or anybody else given you any other ideas that are setting you off like your next graduate degree or ocean voyage? Are you going to go into space with Jeff Bezos or, you know, what's the what's what's next? Well, you know, we're doing a couple. I'm doing a couple of really interesting things. One is I'm starting a, a restaurant in um, in Palm Beach just because I'm spending some time there. And and I, I thought, what, what better restaurant to be then it's a, a you know Hemingway themed restaurant so sure a world restaurant in, in, in Palm Beach called Kohimar which is the village in, in Cuba where Hemingway lived and kept his, his fishing boat uh, so I'm doing that but you know I, I think I always said for my next venture um, you know we'd like to do something that really just has such a broad impact on humanity um, you know an area where there's an immense amount of need um, something where where there's an economic return, but it's, you know, there's more to it. So, you know, we're, we, I've been pondering on, on areas of diseases where, you know, we really haven't been able to do something uh, utterly impactful. And, you know, uh, Alzheimer's is an area I love from a disease perspective. Um, you know, and there's other areas in medicine that- I thought I thought Alzheimer's is now uh, cured with the new uh, Biogen drug that's been approved. <laughs> uh, far from it, but, but you know, there, there's always better tools you can create. And, you know, this is a good tool, but it's, a very beginning tool and you know it's it's jagged and rough and i think we could do better so i i, I want to do something that i think you know as i get as i'm getting in my uh in my older years thinking about doing something that's more meaningful than than uh than just making money i think it'd be great to do something and we've always done that in biotech which is wonderful i mean that's one area of um of you know creating value that i think is exciting because you do make amazing companies and you change the world and I've been lucky. I've, I've done things that have really impacted humans, and I just want to do something bigger. And so that's probably my next my next endeavor something something more meaningful. Great. I guess. Something something bluer. So Joe Hernandez, <laughs> chairman of uh, Blue Water Acquisition Corp, Blue Water Vaccines, among other things. Uh, thank you very much for spending time with me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the the time. Good luck to you. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.